for better or worse, I think I can probably safely say you're the, one of the most high, high profile academic couples who are willing to talk about and um, explore the issues around polyamory. Yeah. What do you make of the fact that you're now kind of the, the, the poster academics for this subject? That there aren't nearly enough other people. <laughs> yeah, one thing you realize if, if, if you get into debates about polyamory versus monogamy, you know, it, it, it was said by a lot of folks in the alt-right, politics is downstream of culture. But culture also apparently is downstream of the mating system. So if you really want to get people riled up, you challenge the mating system that actually dominates, you know, relations between the sexes, but also family structure and has knock-on effects on everything from kind of the design of housing and urban spaces to the design of careers and, um, the extent to which people can kind of use freedom of association to form little families or polycules or communes or whatever. And as soon as you kind of shake the tree of monogamy and challenge that, people panic and they think like, what else might have to change if this is ever questioned? We actually don't really pay that much attention to other polyamorous people because we think that a lot of what other polyamorous people endorse is actively harmful. So not to be, yeah, not to put too fine a point on it, but yeah, we, I mean, I always like to say that we don't endorse it. We just talk about how it can work for some people and about how it is potentially a, you know, the, a better way to have a fuller life for people who can manage jealousy and who, you know, I, I think, I actually don't understand how people do polyamory without an evolutionary perspective, for example, and that is something that we're planning on exploring more in, in writing and in videos, yeah. Yeah, like we don't really hang out in the polyamory Facebook groups or go to poly meetups or go to the conferences or whatever. I've read all the poly books. I've, I'm very familiar with scientific research on it. I've taught a class on polyamory and open relationships. But I think a lot of the, the aspects of at least American polyamory culture are kind of dominated by the same far left you know, ideologies and gender constructivist views that are absolutely handicapping to real relationships. So we kind of like to keep our distance from kind of polyculture, um, even though I think we have a huge respect for the, the impulse to try to have, you know, a, a new ethical approach to relationships that's open and honest and fulfilling and adventurous. And, and it, it's just kind of heartbreaking to see people try to do poly without understanding human nature. Yeah. I think that a lot of people engage in polyamory because they have some kind of ideological commitment, right? They want to show the world that it's possible to escape your monogamous programming, or they have some kind of feminist agenda, or even a communist agenda. They don't want another person to own them. They don't want to be in a contract with someone else. They see exclusive monogamous relationships as some kind of wing of capitalism, for example, and that somebody else owns your labor and owns you as property. And we really do what we do because we think it's fun and fulfilling. And I mean, for me, I'm a utilitarian, really, from an you know from an evolutionary and utilitarian perspective, that I'm I'm having the best time I can have, and not because I'm trying to show people that I'm not owned or that I don't own him, right? Still, a quite small percentage of people actually do open relationships in poly. Um, it's not likely to become the majority anytime soon. Um, so it's almost like the people who thought that you chose to be gay or lesbian thinking we have to keep a lid on that whole homosexuality stuff because, oh my God, everybody would obviously turn gay if they could. Yeah. Uh, like, no, the, there's <laughs> a certain percent of people for whom that works. And I think for us it works. For a certain percentage of other people, polyamory probably could work very well, at least for certain phases of their life. Um, but it'll, it'll be interesting to have a debate like that because I think, you know, the monogamists basically have the view everybody must be monogamous pretty much all the time. And the reasonable polyamorists are like, some people can be poly some of the time at certain life stages if they develop certain skills. But we wouldn't advocate it, I think, for 
it, like it's not ready for prime time, really. Yeah. Mm. I guess the, the question that comes up immediately is what are the skills? I think the, the number one skill that I have that helps me is skepticism towards my own feelings. So understanding that I am an evolved creature, I have certain feelings and thoughts and ruminations and cognitions and just because I have a thought or I feel an, a negative emotion or I feel jealous, for example, doesn't necessarily mean that those feelings are communicating something true that I have to listen to or that I have to solve a problem to reduce, right? It could just be that those things are ways of managing the relationships that I'm in that are in some sense vestigial and I can figure out a way to reduce those feelings. And for me, in terms of all my relationships and everything I think about in terms of evolutionary psychology, um, it goes hand to hand with meditation, actually. I have found meditation to be really helpful for if you take a, a look at your native programming, if you can look at it, the feelings that come up and think about what they are for, from an evolution perspective, then you can actually dissipate those emotions, I think, with mindfulness. And I don't know if anybody else has ever talked about combining these two things, but that's, that's how I do it. Yeah. I think you're also unusually good at articulating what you actually want and then kind of committing to, if I say I want that and then I deliver it, kind of taking responsibility for saying that I should be content with that yeah. rather than sort of going back on your word and saying, no, I, I, like what I actually meant was this. So I think it requires a really high degree of kind of rationality, being articulate, having self-insight, having emotional maturity. Like polyamory is probably a bad idea for kids in high school. Um, and I think it, Diana talked about there, there's a kind of, monogamy has a bunch of hacks and tools and norms that are really good developed over centuries. Polyamory has only been around basically since about 1990 in its current form. And it doesn't have a bunch of those norms and hacks. And the problem is polyculture is so unjudgmental that they're kind of unwilling to say, this works, that doesn't work. Hey, everybody, let's not do that thing again. So I think it has to become more kind of serious and professionalized as a, as a culture that says, like, sorry, the relationship anarchy thing just doesn't actually work because you can't create um, sustainable, predictable commitments with it. Relationship, uh, the hierarchical polyamory, maybe that works better, but here's some ways to tweak it, improve it, etc. So I think if the left owns polyamory as it does now, and if the left really strongly believes in the blank slate and bad communication and hypocrisy, then polyamory is going to fail as a movement. I mean, certainly free love in the 1960s, people have tried to manifest their relationships in such a way that they are a representation of their philosophy. That's happened for a long time. But I do think that polyamory is trying to be a representation of the philosophy that humans are really malleable, that an emotion like jealousy, which obviously has an evolutionary function, and I would totally disagree with the idea, like Christopher Ryan says, that jealousy is in some sense unnatural and is the product of an agricultural society. I think jealousy if you look at hunter-gatherers, you know, as old as, as dirt, as old as um, non-human primates, jealousy is, is very, very important. And so to say, I think that humans can overcome any of their emotions, I think that we're socialized to have these feelings and to be possessive, polyamory is a way of saying I can overcome all of those things because that is not us, but that is us. And so I think the way we think about it is really different in terms of working with our evolved psychology rather than saying there is no human nature. So there's like a kind of communist, idealist, blank slate version of polyamory that's like nobody should own anybody. And we're more of a kind of libertarian polyamory that's like everybody should take responsibility for what they want and what they say and negotiate, you know, consensual win-win relationships that are open and honest. And we don't like polyamory being used as sort of a way to virtue signal leftist ideals. We think it's much like you're dealing with real people to whom you have real responsibilities. Do you think it's relevant that you're evolutionary psychologist that you think this way? Yeah, I think, I mean, two things that kind of turned me polyamorous were number one, being in evolutionary psychology and seeing the range of mating systems that are out there. 
and thinking the range of what people actually do in modern society is perhaps overly limited, right? And then meeting her and seeing, oh, she actually runs her life in a successful and rational way doing this polyamory thing that I knew very little about. So as I learned about it, I thought, this is great. There's a lot here, very interesting, this experimental subculture, very well-intentioned often. But there's a lot of stuff they're doing in, in crazy dysfunctional ways, partly because they don't understand sex differences or won't talk about them. They don't understand human evolution and mating strategies. Um, they don't even understand why monogamous marriage was invented. Like they don't have enough respect for monogamy to actually understand like which parts of it should be challenged first. And I thought, that, so this is a very promising subculture that might just implode under the weight of its own virtue signaling. And that would be kind of tragic. I think another polyamorous idea is that there is no limit on love, that you can love everyone infinitely. And that's part of also relationship anarchy, that you can have these malleable relationships with people, your relationships can all accommodate each other, everything should be really fluid, you shouldn't have any kind of stable negotiation or idea about what your relationship is going to be like with any particular person. And I think that that is very difficult. I, I think it can be very exciting, obviously, but I think that relationships that have no stability, that have no kind of home base, can be incredibly heartbreaking, can cause a, a tremendous amount of jealousy. And especially if you're living some big cosmopolitan area and you're a young person, like you're somebody young living here in, in London, uh, there's this troop of people I think called the unicorns and they're polyamorous and there was some Vice documentary about their um, different problems. And you, you definitely see that without kind of a, a home base, without any one particular person that you have a, a serious bond with, it can actually just leave you feeling very lonely and, and, and abandoned continuously. And so that's kind of one problem. The other idea is that somebody can, you know, through talking out your problems, through discussing things with people, you can eradicate your jealousy with conversation, right? Because it was socially constructed or it's, it's, it's from an agricultural society or whatever. So it actually should be easy to deprogram yourself of jealousy because there's nothing deep rooted or in, you know, fundamentally human about it. And in some sense, I, you know, that's a kind of growth mindset I can appreciate. But on the other hand, it does cause a huge amount of shame that I know of people who can't seem to relinquish their, their jealousy. And I know that polyamorous people sometimes look down on, for example, uh, people in open relationships or swingers. I actually think swinging is like a really great tech, you could call it a technology of figuring out how to solve the problem of sexual boredom and also how to get the excitement of seeing your partner flirt with or being attracted to someone else. It's a deeply natural thing to see your partner flirting with or interacting with somebody else who thinks that they're attractive. And it definitely makes you think more of your partner's uh, value. It makes you value them more and potentially take them for granted less. But we don't see our partners in context like that very much in a society where people are nuclear families and they're atomized. So I know polyamorous people who sort of poo-poo um, swinging, but swinging is actually a really ingenious solution to that problem. It's pretty hard to be jealous if you're currently having sex with somebody else. And also if you as a couple have sex with other couples, which is what swingers uh, generally do, then there's also a aspect of having a new experience together, which can strengthen your, your basic relationship. The infinite love thing I keep encountering, right? And it's, it's completely bizarre, because from my point of view, romantic love as an emotion, right, is actually a way of, for a person to go, here is a potential mate. They seem like a good prospect. I'm going to focus my mating effort on them. Being in love means I'm going to devote a lot of time and energy and attention to courting them and impressing them. So the, it is a way of taking limited resources and channeling them to a potential mate. That's what romantic love or being in love is. And if the polyamory people say, but love is infinite, it's like, why do you guys use Google Calendar to organize your dates then? Like time is finite, money is finite, attention is finite, the amount of talking you can handle is finite if you're an introvert. So why pretend that like love is infinite 
if every constituent element of love is finite and has to be managed carefully. It's just fucking empty rhetoric. It sounds like you're almost thinking about it in a masculine kind of transactional way. I think transactional is, is probably fair. I, I, yeah, I mean, you could say that I'm thinking about it in a, in a masculine way. Well, you've got quite a masculine brain in certain ways, but people say transactional like that's a bad thing. But we're both kind of libertarian, and to us, like transactional is is win-win voluntary exchanges of like goods and services and affection and commitment. So, if you're upfront about what the transaction is, and also how likely is it to be repeated, how long will it last, are you committed? That's a good thing because that's honest and and open. I think the the problem with polyamory at the moment is. It hasn't been around long enough, right? It's only been around 30 years for it to, to develop good kind of social norms and expectations about all these roles and how they work. It would be as if you tried to, to run a Fortune 500 company, but you had just invented the concept of a boss and a laborer and management and, and accounting and marketing, and you were trying to invent all of it all at once, right? It'll probably take two or three generations before polyamory regularly works like anywhere near as well as monogamous marriage, yeah. which has been under continual R&D for thousands of years. Yeah, there's like a technology with monogamy. There's common problems that you have, and you can talk to your grandma or your mom about the problems that you're having with your spouse, and they'll have advice that they know from other people because everybody has done this. Whereas with polyamory, it is a very weird subculture. It is a fringe subculture, and actually being really clear about your expectations for other is actually a violation of many of the rules of that subculture, which is that there's limitless love, and you know, in some sense, a lot of these people are nearly limitless time that they have to expend on these multiple relationships that they're cultivating. And I think maybe polyamory for busy people is what we're sort of looking at, but also a technology of polyamory, which is saying, actually, you know, you have to bring evolutionary psychology, an understanding of human nature, an understanding of emotions, and also a skeptical view of your own emotions and your own jealousy to bear. Otherwise, it's actually not going to work. Because if you think everything's socialized, if you think everybody's infinitely malleable, and if you believe that your relationships should be able to adapt and take any form from one day to the next in an almost you know, protean way, then it's going to be pretty hard to organize your life around variables that are not at all consistent. And the other thing that people in sort of the, the, the polyamorous communities that I know um, and people on the fringes of it say is it's just endless processing. It's just endless emotional labor and processing and, and they find it far more difficult than a monogamous relationship just because of that kind of emotional time spent. Yeah, so we, we, I know we sort of sound like very cold calculating sociopaths and how we discuss this, but this is through like years of kind of bittersweet experience of realizing that if you have a clear enough frame for what you're doing and you can explain it clearly enough to other people, then there's actually room for a whole lot of affection and tenderness and, and love and passion to flourish without all this fucking processing, without all the verbal fireworks. The vaguer you are, the less well you know yourself, the more you have to constantly renegotiate everything with everyone. So I think the typical levels of polydrama that people get into are a direct result of polyamory not having enough clear hacks for how to do this stuff efficiently. Um, and you know, in monogamy, there's also plenty of emotional processing drama, like married couples fight. Um, and one of the big points of couples therapy is to equip people with better ways to fight you know, that are less destructive. I think Polly has to embrace that and has to be willing to say, um, you know, w the way to get to the um, limitless love and, and being able to have wonderful close relationships with people is kind of to be just brutally economic and upfront about what your, your parameters are and your rules and your norms. And like, 
take the things seriously and, and don't always be trying to play catch up. So like, well, that didn't work, let's process it. Oh, that failed as well, let's process that some more. Like, that's no way to live. Yeah, so I think that, that you know, polyamorous people do tend to have very open and honest dialogues, often about how they're feeling, but it's not really couched in anything in particular. Like, I think when th something's couched in evolutionary psychology, so, for example, uh, you, you can ask, you can have them leave this in or not, but I'm going to tell a little story. All right. All right. So, um, uh, we had a, a woman that we see together stay with us for several days, and while we were all together, I missed Jeffrey, even though he was there with me the whole time. But when we were all three of us together, he didn't, I was there. He's like, why would I miss you? You were there the whole time, right? And so um, after she left, I was very excited to have like his attention all to myself again. And if, from an evolutionary perspective, obviously that, that makes sense. Like I'm trying to, in some sense, well not in just some sense, in, in every sense, sort of monopolize his investment. And so that's why I felt so relieved. And if I had no understanding about that, I might feel ashamed or bad that I was excited to have him all to myself or that, because I didn't actually feel jealous when we were together. I just felt like I wanted his attention and I was happy to have his attention again when we got back together. Anyway, yeah. that's or you might, you might mis <laughs> misconstrue your yeah. unhappiness as being either my fault right, or her fault. You might not have the words to express what you actually wanted from me. Yeah. And, and that's the royal road towards serious conflict yeah. is if you, if you don't know your own heart well enough through science, right? And you're just kind of, kind of trying to wing it based on yeah. like, well, I learned this from reading that little bit of self-help and I learned this from that like tantric seminar and I learned this from taking ayahuasca in Peru and you cobble it together yourself, it's really hard to make sense of some of these little issues that pop yeah. up. Because we, we've talked mostly about kind of the individual, the psychological aspects of it so far, yeah. but there are sort of societal ramifications. Um, and I know that's something that, that evolutionary biologists, for example, are, are, are very interested in. It's like, what would it look like if we kind of moved over wholesale towards a new relation, yeah. relationship model? And one of, the, one of the criticisms is that what would happen is that there would be a sort of a small set of hyper successful men and polygamy would degenerate into polygyny, which is kind of one man, one man having access to many women. What, what do you make of that? I'll, I'll start talking about two things. So uh, one thing is that I think that there's a number of different kinds of relationship architectures that you can look at. And we've picked and cho you know, chosen from a variety of different ideas in order to cobble together a system that kind of works for us. Uh, but Dan Savage, who's a, a prominent you know, sex advice columnist, talks about something called monogamish which is being monogamous, but then having some room for outside liaisons. And that can be something as small as, you know, somebody seeing a sex worker. It can be don't ask, don't tell out of town kind of thing. There's all kinds of different ways of looking at it. And so this monogamish actually seems to me the most stable relationship architecture. So I don't think that polyamory is necessarily super stable, especially not as it's practiced uh, overall. And there's a couple reasons why I think monogamish is more stable than straight monogamous, right? Um, one of these ideas is that in monogamous culture, there's this idea that if you want to have sex with or you have a crush on or you have romantic ruminations about someone else, it means that there's something lacking in your kind of home base pair relationship. And that's, I think, a very pernicious and bad idea. And so what happens sometimes is that one person or the other will start to fantasize about a third person and then they'll think, okay, I'm risking so much in terms of my main relationship by having fantasies about this other person that cognitive dissonance clicks in and they think I must be really in love with this other person and not all in love with my partner if I'm willing to take these risks for this other person. And then what will sometimes happen is, you know, this new relationship energy, right? There's this flurry of excitement about this other person and then ultimately it burns out. You don't know the person as well as you thought you did, for example. So I think we evolved in a system where there was a lot of monogamy, at least for several years, oftentimes while children were young, but there was also a lot of dalliances and there was a lot of affairs and there was a lot of seeing, you know, who you were going to see next. And so I think that monogamish, which is having some 
uh, outside allowance um, reduces the chance of a, a stable relationship necessarily breaking up because the person who cheats, for example, or who asks to make a negotiation isn't risking everything. And also the idea isn't that if you want to sleep with somebody else, it means that your primary relationship is is doomed or is you're not in love with that person anymore. The other thing people have to understand is mating market dynamics and like what's the local sex ratio? What is this distribution of mate values that's relevant? How, how do people pair up? I mean the weird thing is you see a lot of people in their 20s doing casual dating which is basically disorganized unethical polyamory that's unself-aware right and where they're not actually telling anybody they're dating, like who else they're dating, what their commitment level is, you know, are they getting regular STI testing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think it remains to be seen, like, A, what percent of men and what percent of women can handle, you know, open, honest polyamory, and B, what are the kind of mating market results of that? I think in certain contexts, like China, where you have this huge excess of unmarried single men who aren't going to be able to find monogamous women, certain kinds of polyamory might be a really good idea for the Chinese government to kind of consider. Because otherwise, like, what's their, what's their release valve for tens of millions of, of guys who can't find a girlfriend? That is not a recipe for social stability. Um, so again, I think it's the, the important thing is to kind of recognize this is an experimental subculture. We need to have like clear metrics of success. We need to be honest about the pros and cons. We need to be respectful of traditional marriage and monogamy and go, there's a lot of embodied wisdom in what a lot of people do. And you can't just reject it before you understand it, right? There's a kind of Chesterton Spence issue here. like. We think we understand monogamous marriage more than most people do because we've lived an alternative to it. And we kind of know what the kind of costs and benefits are and what would have to be managed in terms of boredom, also in terms of you know women like high status men. And if you are around your mate all the time, especially in isolated nuclear households, and you never see anyone else admiring your mate or flirting with your mate or trying to gossip about you so they can steal your mate, then you get no cues at all that they're desirable to anybody else. And that is a very, very unnatural environment, artificial environment. When people talk about this top percent of percentage of women, whatever, 15%, 20%, um, being competed for by the vast majority of women, and that these are the men who are getting all the mating opportunities, they think that polyamory and open relationships is simply going to exacerbate that problem, and that the men who are the incels or who are losing out on the mating game are just going to lose harder. But I haven't really had that experience at all, so I've been involved in these kind of cultures of, of that are very matriarchal, where it's a lot of women that uh, date various different men and they all vouch for certain men and they'll often there's just so little jealousy about men they'll say this guy just makes a wonderful meal and he t will take you on a really lovely date and so the kind of man who wouldn't necessarily make a good full-time boyfriend or who potentially needs leveling up before they get to the point where they can be a good full-time boyfriend is actually the kind of person who'd be great to see once a week, right? So there's this idea of something called a relationship escalator which is you start seeing each other you know, every once in a while, then you see each other more, then you move in together, then you get married, then you have children, then you die. <laughs> and, and that is the relationship escalator. And kind of an alternative to that is that, and, and the people find this really profoundly unromantic, but I think about the people I date and the, and the kind of social and sexual sphere that I'm in as kind of a marketplace, right? And I have people that I trade with, right, more, most often, and that I engage with most often, there are really blurry lines between um, friends and lovers, and obviously people can come in and out of my life in, in various different roles, but I have an idea about what, you know, what I want from somebody else and what role they'll fulfill, and they don't have to be everything and, ev and, and all things to me, and so that puts a lot less pressure on them, but also we get to enjoy each other and we get to enjoy a certain amount of variety that we wouldn't be able to if we were just closed off to one another. And in terms of strengthening the primary relationship that I'm in with Jeffrey, I see him having other people admiring him, having other people flirt with him. I see how he manages other relationships with other people, and it actually 
causes me to admire him more and to think that I'm getting a better deal and also to be happier to share him because in that sense, if somebody is high status and is admired by multiple people, then you're getting, a, a sharing is better than having one person all to yourself that no one else wants. Well, also you're really good at like taking kind of weird, aspie, eccentric guys and <laughs> who would not make good primary boyfriends and kind of leveling them up and training them so that they are then presentable to other women, right? That's and true. that's the thing you've done, <laughs> you've done multiple yeah. times. So it's actually really good for those, you know, incels, yeah. like to meet a woman like her who can kind of go, okay, you're not quite good enough to be full-time boyfriend, <laughs> right? But you have certain traits that are enjoyable and here's how to cultivate your other traits. And I think that's a better path for those like Aspies or incels or whatever to, to meet someone like her rather than to kind of like meet a woman who's saying, okay, you're a dysfunctional, broken young man, but you're the best I can get as a woman because I'm also broken and dysfunctional. Like that's, that's not a good way forward. Is that fair? Yeah, that's totally fair. Yeah, and I, and I have done that. I've so been like, this is how you take a woman on a date. This is, yeah. No, and I... And providing a social service. And I, yeah, and I, I, I like Aspie men because I like the way they think and I like that, that kind of systemizing thing. But also, I'm very transparent. My facial expressions are very transparent. I'm very clear about what I want. And so I think that women can learn a lot. And, and Aspies, I mean, now we're going on about talking about dating Aspies, but uh, they actually can be really great to date because they do want to make you happy. They just don't know how to do it with unconscious or cues or reading facial expressions or whatever. If you tell somebody exactly what you want and they want to make you happy, it's very easy. It's only when you have an expectation that somebody's going to infer what you want that you have these various different problems. And if somebody figures out what a woman wants, it's a lot easier to figure out what other women want afterwards. But yeah, definitely I've, I've, I've dated guys who have you know, never had a girlfriend before. And I'm being like, I actually can't be your full-time girlfriend. Your job this week is to go on four dates and you tell me how they are. And, and I really love to do that. It's, it's not a chore at all, yeah. Famously, Jordan Peterson got into trouble for talking about enforced monogamy. <laughs> Um, and his point, I think, was that monogamy evolves. It's societally and culturally enforced, yeah. and it's an evolutionary trait. So as evolutionary psychologists, are you not persuaded by the argument that monogamy has evolved time and time again in cultures as a kind of, as a, as a way of coping with, with the pressures of life and a way of furthering the species? Yeah. So monogamy has been very important because the men who are the most likely to be violent and the most likely to cause problems in any given society are those men who are out of the mating game. So men who don't have a wife or a girlfriend are many times more likely to engage in homicide or really risky bad behavior. Uh, one of the best predictors of a young man cleaning his life up is actually him getting a girlfriend or a wife, for example. And so young men who are unmated or who don't have the, the, the faculties, like the resources or whatever, to get a long-term mate have always been dangerous in society. And so what you've seen is there's been monogamy as a cultural beam that has enabled these men to each be assigned a woman and thus it actually re reduces the kind of likelihood of insurgents, for example. So that does make sense, right? But what I think Jordan Peterson is failing to understand is that if there were more people who were having open relationships and some young men, for example, who were not necessarily good material for a woman to date full time, but were good enough for somebody or a couple women to see casually, that guy, I think, is just as unlikely to engage in difficult uh, and aggressive and criminal behavior as somebody who is married, right? Yeah, I mean, if a guy is really not good husband material and you kind of shoe him, shoehorn him into husband role, kind of against his wishes, like he's, he's just not really capable of that kind of sexual commitment. What you're basically asking is for some poor woman to fall on the sword for the greater good of society to put up with this motherfucker <laughs> and, and like do the best she can with him. Whereas in a polyamorous society, he might be able to find women who actually kind of like his 
dark streak or his bad boyness or the fact that he spends, you know, three out of four weeks working on some oil rig somewhere or whatever. There's just more flexibility. So just the way that the free market with money is better than a barter economy, right? Um, a polyamorous society could be better for everybody in terms of exchanging sex and romance. Yeah. Um, than trying to, to fit everybody into this monogamous paradigm. Another uh, thing that, that people who are kind of more traditionalists talk about a lot is about how if there were more polyamorous people and there was more kind of casual, non-exclusive negotiated relationships, that fewer people would be have investing fathers, right? We're not really sure exactly how much a, a investing father figure is actually important. So it does seem like it could be quite important, but it also seems like the men who are likely to leave also have certain genetic qualities, right? They tend to be more promiscuous, they tend to be more criminal, for example, and so it's very hard to tease apart the environmental and the genetic effects. So I know that some people think that even if you've made polyamory more popular, that there would be many fewer investing fathers in the picture. But I think well, that... Like the irony is it's not that hard to tease apart the effects. You do a large twin study and you can tease them apart. And what we find is, in fact, almost all of the traits that people say are due to absent fathers are actually heritable traits that are not much influenced by family structure. So, right, the irony is a lot of the people who are saying we need monogamy because we need dads, because we need role models, and who, you know, in other contexts will be like, you should never ignore the behavior genetics. Yeah. But in this domain, they're ignoring the behavior genetics. And like they're making a kind of blank slate argument that says, it really, really deeply matters that you have a stable family home or else the kid will grow up to be a terrible person. It's like, that is not what the twin studies show. And do you think you, you're typical in your emotional reactions? <laughs> or, or is there something special about the way that you guys are able to approach it that, that is different to, to how most people approach yeah. their relationships? That's why I don't think, I, I, I often say I don't endorse polyamory, like I don't endorse my particular relationship style. I just sort of endorse certain kind of tactics and I definitely need to get all of this kind of down in, in blogs or on paper at, at some point. But yeah, I'm, I'm really strange uh, in many ways, like I'm unusual, I'm, I'm not you know, neurotypical in a lot of ways. Um, so I tend to not feel bad feelings for very long. And I tend to have a, you know, even when I was a child, I had quite a kind of utilitarian way of thinking about things. So my view has always been, if I'm distressed or I feel bad or I feel jealous, if, for example, because of me being able to be stoical about those feelings or being able to manage those feelings, Jeffrey and somebody that I like, especially somebody I like, if they're enjoying each other's company, then I'm actually doing something kind of for the greater good, right? I'm, and, and I think Jeffrey is wonderful, so in some sense I feel, I would feel guilty monopolizing him entirely, and it's actually very much the kind of utilitarian reasons that I think about it, and most people would not think about things that way. Instead, they would think about how they were maximizing their cues of commitment and loyalty by acting incredibly jealously or by having a proprietary feeling about somebody. So I think in that way I'm unusual. I have a very kind of high hedonic state. I'm happy all the time is basically what I'm trying to say. Yeah, you're, you're happy. I think it helps that you're bisexual. Yeah, it helps a lot, a lot. that I'm bisexual, yeah. Like. So, so I, I um, there's this concept that red pill people use a lot which is called hypergamy. And hypergamy is a woman's desire to be with a man who's higher in status than than she is. And you see this in romance novels all the time, women who are with billionaires, millionaires, sheriffs, kings, whatever the case may be. And so the way that I manage my jealousy to a great extent is because I'm attracted often to the women that Jeffrey sees and also because I think about him having high status. The best indicator of a man's status is how many women like him and desire him because women are really, really good at sussing out how quality a man is. So if Jeffrey has other women who are interested in him, it increases my perception of how good he is and it actually makes me feel really in love and excited about him, right? So that's kind of how I deal with it and that's a, a kind of a very primitive emotion like this, you have status, me want you, <laughs> that's super primitive. But I really, 
it has really good outcomes in terms of me managing my jealousy. So I inflate that emotion and I use it all the time in order to enjoy whatever it is that we've negotiated. Yeah. And I'm just Aspie. So <laughs> it's always, I mean, I'm very rational. I'm very systematizing. I, I, I seek out principled solutions to issues, things that make sense. I hate inconsistency. I hate hypocrisy. And so um, it was very, and a lot of people in polyamory who, who are good at it, I think have a little bit of that Aspergery sort of hyper rationality because they're willing to kind of take a step back from just their... Just keep track of the calendars, you've got to be calm. Right, you have to, like, systematizing and, and to be able to take a step back from your kind of monogamist um, background and think seriously about alternatives. Um, I think it helps to have a kind of uh, experimental scientific attitude. Um, and a kind of epistemic humility also that says, oh, man, I don't know, I'm, we're just going to try it out and see what happens and learn as we go and try to keep notes about what succeeds and fails. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're also sort of irreplaceable to each other. This is going to sound really romantic, but I don't want it to. So <laughs> basically, we're both really unusual in several different ways, right? Uh, I actually tend to attract people who are Aspie because I'm incredibly emotionally transparent and my facial expression is very transparent. And it doesn't bother me to say exactly what I want. I think many women don't want to say exactly what they want because part of the cue investment that they're looking for is for somebody to use enough cognitive cycles to guess what they want. So I think that that's a, a, a big part of it. But we are very unusually suited to one another and we are irreplaceable to one another. So that's why we can have a hierarchical relationship where I'm not worried that somebody's going to replace me or that anybody's going to replace him. But most people, if you look at Tinder, how, what do you know about somebody if you look at them on Tinder? You know that they live close by and you know what their face looks like, maybe, right? But people get married with people that they meet on Tinder all the time. Back in the day, people would get married to people who just lived around the corner. So proximity and attraction are the main reasons that people get together, not because they have any deep-seated, interesting stuff in common or that they have unusual you know, lifestyles or whatever the case may be. So if two people, all they have in common is that they're nice to each other and they're attracted to each other, they are infinitely replaceable by anybody else. And it's going to be very difficult for them to do hierarchical poly without somebody else you know, coming in and taking people's places again and again and again. And that's what you see also in polyamorous communities a lot is this constant kind of switching of partners and the endless conversations that people have, emotional conversations. And I actually think that people like that. I think that's why they do it. Otherwise, or, or they don't have anything else fulfilling in their lives. So it's something that they're trying uh, to maximize. Another way that people can have unique things in common, and you see this a lot, is somebody will be monogamous for a long time, and then they'll open up their relationship a little bit. And as Dan Savage says, just because you open up your relationship doesn't mean you have to blow the door off its hinges, right? You can have a relationship opened up a little bit. And there's this terrible bias, unfortunately, in that you hear all the time about people who say, we opened up our relationship, everything went to shit, and now we're broken up. You very rarely hear, because so many people are on the down low or in the closet about having open relationships, we decided to have an open relationship and everything worked out marvelously, right? And so, yeah, maybe it's the case that people open their relationships up and it's more likely to end badly, but we wouldn't know because we have a completely biased sample. We only hear about how open relationships screw things up because that's the only time we hear about people having opened up their relationship. Is that one of the reasons that you guys want to be open about talking about it? We just like attention. No. <laughs> I, think, I think, yeah, we, we feel like it's important, but also it is one way in which we use evolutionary psychology in our day-to-day -day lives and our knowledge about the psychology of relationships. I think it's important for people to have, um, to be able to see couples who are like reasonable people and not sort of, freaky California, new age delusionals, like being able to do an open relationship and, and talk about it honestly, its pros and its cons and why it wouldn't necessarily work for everybody and not to sort of proselytize it recklessly. I think that's really important because if folks like us are sort of on the down low and like quietly doing open and we're only letting the most extreme weird people show up on reality TV as like the exemplars of polyamory, 
I think that's terrible, right? It would be like if the only examples of, of monogamous marriage that you ever saw were just people fighting during divorce court. Like, th th that doesn't make monogamy look very good either. And you said um, proselytizing then, and I think that kind of links into what I think some people feel um, so triggered, maybe, by certain aspects of polyculture, which kind of fe feels like people are sort of eva evangelizing it and saying, well, it's the next evolutionary step. Like, there's this kind of either implicit or explicit kind of sense of, well, you're just not ev evolved enough. If you were more evolved, you would be poly and monogamy is something that we're going to evolve past. You don't think, what do you make of that? There is that sort of sense in some areas of the poly community. Oh I yeah, guess. a lot of them have, have a sort of progressive utopian cult that eventually, like in a hundred years, everyone will be enlightened and polyamorous and able to overcome their jealousy programming and blah, blah, blah. And, and I think the percentage of people who are in successful poly and open relationships or swingers will increase. It already is increasing, especially among young people. Um, but I don't think monogamous marriage is going to evaporate anytime soon. It has many, many benefits to individuals, couples, kids, civilization, etc. Um, my main concern is just create the broadest market that you can for, for different mating systems, be experimental, see what works, trade information about successes and failures, um, and then hopefully in a couple more generations we'll have a sort of sense of like, these are the top three or four kinds of relationships that tend to work pretty well for most people. And one of those might be monogamous marriage, one of them probably will be hierarchical poly. There might be a couple of others people invent. I don't know. I mean, people have definitely said stuff about, uh, you know, on Twitter. People actually very rarely come after me on Twitter. It's not an invitation, by the way. And they say it's kind of elitist the way we say, like, oh, you kind of have to have very high emotional intelligence. You have to be smart. You have to be uh, have a unique bond in order to be polyamorous. Mostly, I've seen polyamorous people say that anybody can be polyamorous. And I have... Mm, followed some polyamorous groups in places like small cities in England to see all of the crazy drama that gets kicked up there because people are managing relationships without any kind of understanding of human nature, I think. So it's important, I think, to, to talk about it. Uh, but I also think it's important for people to be able to evaluate themselves and for some people to say, no, I really want to be monogamous with somebody long term, but to consider actually that both men and women have desire for sexual and romantic variety, that wanting to have sex with somebody else doesn't necessarily mean that you've fallen out of love with the person that you're with, and also to examine how this, this very isolated culture that we've put together, where people don't live in any kind of communal way, where they live really you know, isolated from everyone else, about how that's also contributing to this monogamous culture where people are really starving for even outside friendship. And I, I think one thing that polyamory does is because you know when you have lovers or friends who are also sometimes lovers, you actually just develop closer bonds with them. And it's helped me have a much more, whatever, I think close expanded network than people I know who are monogamous. And that's, I think, a big difference between people. People who go to church tend to be happier than people who don't. But also people in unique sexual subcultures tend to be happier in their relationships because their extended network has this, this pleasurable component which knits them together more tightly than other kinds of groups would, would be knitted together. I saw um, Brett Weinstein uh, tweet the other day saying, so he's a skeptic about polyamory, but he said, if anyone can pull this off, then Jeffrey and Diana can pull it off. I think someone else said so, that about us, but did he say that too? Yeah, so, oh, that's kind. <laughs> so, so if you can't, then I guess nobody can. Are you comfortable holding that much responsibility? No, I mean, no, because life is stochastic and like we could fuck it up and hopefully we won't, yep. but we could fuck it up. <laughs> and this is why it's so important to have a wider variety of people kind of coming out and saying, we're swingers, we're open, we're poly. And people who like actually have like paid jobs and not 
and who don't necessarily live in Southern California and who don't necessarily just hang out with other Burning Man people to kind of normalize it, right? The way that gay and lesbian culture got normalized in the 90s with like sitcoms that showed, oh, you can be gay and employed, right? And in a committed relationship. And I think, you know, it's very kind for, for folks to say, well, if, if, if we two can't succeed, nobody can. But um, it's not like we have some weird poly superpower. It's just that we're smart people who've worked really hard to get in touch with our emotions, who've learned all we can about polyculture, who have the appropriate degree of skepticism about it, and who have a deep and abiding respect for tradition and monogamy and marriage and don't just reject it all as bullshit. And who go like, poly like polyamory to me like might be 30% better than monogamous marriage, but it's not like 8,000% better. Yeah, and I do think that it you know comes down to you know people trying things out, their personal experience. Uh, jealousy can be desensitized. It takes a really long time. But you know when you talk about the elephant and the rider, this kind of analogy about the mind, people just imagine how jealous they would feel if their partner went off with somebody else, right? And then right away that makes them have a moral problem. <clears throat> Uh, mm -hmm. With any talk about polyamory, and I've heard people, you know, had conversations with lots of people who are otherwise totally rational about, you know, they'd be totally rational about like organ markets and legalized prostitution and all this other stuff. And then you get to polyamory, and they're just immediately thinking about their partner in flagrante delicto with somebody else, and they're like, no, it's super wrong, it's terrible. And you know, you have to you have to think about where your response is coming from. All of us uh, endorse or 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 have serious problems with the ideologies based on how we would think it would affect us. So I think this kind of idea about civilizational collapse is just one way of people actually managing their own feelings. Jeffrey, Diana, thank you very much. Thank you.